On January 1st, Antonio Bueller was arrested for photographing cops in Austin, Texas. Recently, I spoke with him via Skype about his lingering court case. There is no way on earth we'll ever even consider a plea. The following CopBlock.org video is brought to you by NeverTakeAPlea.org. Well, as far as the legal system goes, they've just been postponing um, court dates over and over again. So I've shown up at the courthouse probably five times by now, and each time I show up, I sit around for an hour or two, and then they tell me, okay, you can come back on another date. And uh, this has happened um, ever since early January. You know, we were hoping that a grand jury would convene back in April, so <laughs> it's uh, or March. Um, so we don't really know what's ha happening with regards to the timing, but we do know that that the cops, the only thing that they have on their side is the testimony of Oborsky. That's the only thing that um, supports any of his claims is his own testimony. But everything else, all the other witnesses, the video, it all refutes what Oborsky says, and so. Um, the fact that the city hasn't uh, dismissed this and apologized a long time ago, and the fact that they've backed up this criminal cop, it just shows how deep the corruption is. If they're willing to go this far on something that is so blatantly a crime by their cop. Well, it seems like um, over and over again I hear the word of the police officer has so much more weight than even video evidence that really if you're charged with anything you're guilty and you have to prove your innocence in court yeah it's a shame and that's what we've been talking to people with the peaceful streets project is we explain to people how important it is to have video because in our society you're not innocent until proven guilty you're guilty until proven innocent and without proof that the cop is the one who committed the crime there's a very good chance that you're going to end up going to jail. And so um, we aren't out there videotaping cops. This isn't a way for us to try to poke our finger in the eyes of the police. What we're trying to do is we're trying to protect each other from criminal cops. And uh, if there was a guy across the street who was videotaping me that night, I think I'd be in a very, very different situation. Have you been offered a plea deal? No. I think that I was so forceful about it and I made the point so clear early on that there was no way that I would ever take a plea that they haven't even tried to come uh, to the table with that. I also told my lawyer the same thing. When I was meeting with lawyers who were going to represent me, uh, one condition that I had for them was that there was no way on earth we'll ever even consider a plea. Just briefly go over the incident that led to your arrest, January 1st. Yeah, so I was with my friend. I was actually the designated driver, so I wasn't drinking that night. I was coming back from our second house party that we were at. We left relatively early compared to most people because we just went on call at night. I had a lot of work to do the next day. And so he lives on the east side. I live on the west side. Uh, and so I'm driving from the west side to the east side to drop him off and we're running out of fuel so we roll into the 7-Eleven which is on West Lamar or Lamar and West 10th um, near downtown Austin. Uh, we pull in to fill up with gas and in between us and the road is a black sedan that's pulled over with two cop cars behind it. The female driver is out behind the vehicle doing a field sobriety test, and there's a female in the passenger seat. We drive up, and we see it's cold out. It was very cold that night, uh, unseasonably cold in Austin. And she's standing there in high heels and just a, a very, very light gown and was freezing. You could tell, and I looked over at Ben. I was like, there's no way she's going to pass this test um, because no one would under those circumstances. And so we, we were watching um, just to see how long it was going to take them to uh, go through with that whole thing, maybe even allow her to take her shoes off or put a jacket on. Um, but there was no reason for us to get involved in anything. We were, just, we were just observing. But at one point, the cop who was doing the field sobriety walks up to the car, leans in, 
says something to the passenger, comes back, and then the other cop comes around to the passenger side and starts talking to the female. We're about finished with our uh, pumping up the gas, and the cop who went up to the passenger side, his name is Robert Snyder, he opens the door. And from our view, it looked like they were just having a conversation. She was very, very pa uh, passive and benign, um, docile and benign. And he opens the door, and it just looked like he was bored and wanted to talk to a pretty girl. So we get ready to leave, and all of a sudden we just hear this violent scream. We turn around, and Robert Snyder is yanking this woman out of the car, throwing her to the ground. So me and my friend, we step to the back of the truck, and we pull out our cameras, and we try to take pictures. And then Patrick Oborski, the other cop, comes over and joins in on the fray, and they're just abusing this female. And we're, the woman looked at me, and she saw me holding my camera up trying to take a picture, and so she cried and begged, you know, please take pictures, please record this. So as soon as I heard that, I just started yelling at the cops, what are you doing, why are you hurting her, she didn't do anything wrong. And, and they pick her up and walk her back towards the back squad car, and halfway there, a Borski comes back and comes charging towards me, saying, who the hell do you think you are? You know, and, you know, so I, I just say, oh, it doesn't matter who I am, I'm allowed to do this, I'm in a public place, you're a public official, I'm allowed to film. And he gets in my face, and he's screaming at me, and all of a sudden he pushes me. As soon as he pushes me, I throw my hands up in the air, and I start yelling, why are you touching me? You have no right to touch me. And he just keeps pushing me, pushes me into the back of the truck. The entire time I have my hands up, um, asking him, you know, why are you pushing me, and then telling him to get out of my face, I didn't do anything wrong. And then he starts to try to grab my hand to uh, cuff him. I'm asking him what he's doing. And then he tries to take me down, puts me in sort of a chokehold from behind, and eventually takes me down. Once I'm uh, uh, arrested, uh, at that point, they took me to what we call the Batmobile, which is where they have the breathalyzer. And they had me blow. And I asked them why they were making me blow because I wasn't pulled over, and I wasn't drunk, and I asked them if they were just trying to find a way to charge me with something. Um, because I was completely sober, I decided to, to take the breathalyzer just to see what the score was. Well, after I blew, um, I started asking the guy what my score was, because I wanted him to tell me that it was 0, 0.00, and at that point, he said that I broke the breathalyzer because I blew too hard. I was the first one to ever break the breathalyzer. So then I just got really disgusted. I started laughing at him. Um, you know, just said that this entire thing is a joke. And a Borski comes in, back into the vehicle, and the technician <clears throat> looks at him and says, um, "Well, you know, is this guy in here for a DUI?" And a Borski goes, "Oh, uh, no." And then uh, he looks at me and says, "Well, what are you in here for?" I said, "Well, I saw this guy uh, roughing up a uh, uh, roughing up a female, so I decided to take pictures and ask questions." At that time, Aborski grabs me by the arm, takes me out to the cattle car, the huge truck that they transport drunk people in, and they had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, where he basically told me, "You don't f with police, you know, you don't get in our effing way, and you're gonna learn your effing lesson." And then uh, that's the last time I saw him. And by the time I was at uh, Central Booking, I found out what he meant by "you don't f with the police, you're gonna learn your effing lesson," is that he fabricated a charge a felony two to ten years uh, charge that I spit in his face. You have now the Peaceful Streets Project. Uh, did this arise out of your um, experience with the Austin PD? Well, it did arise out of what happened to me. Just because police abuse in this town, again, like all towns, you know, it's been going on forever. And the people who are subject to the police abuse the most are the people who are in marginalized communities. They're either poor, or they're Hispanic, or black, or homeless, or uh, illegal immigrants, or whatever you want to call uh, you know the marginalized groups. But they're the ones who um, get the brunt of police misconduct and abuse uh, probably everywhere. And so the great majority of the people think that, well, the cops are here to protect us against those people, and uh, I never have a problem with a cop, only if I'm speeding or drunk driving, you know, and, and that's the mentality, but, you know, since this incident, 
I've just had so many people come forward with just really, really horrible stories of police abuse here in Austin alone, in just the last couple of years alone. And so it's it's obvious to me and to other people who were working with me to try to expose what the police have done uh, in my case that this problem is endemic and it, it's pervasive and, and it's something that's destroying many, many lives. So, uh, so myself and those activists, um, we saw this as a platform to, to really reach out to a segment of the population that just does not believe that police abuse is a problem and we saw this as a way to to go ahead and, and, and make it an issue where people start to get concerned and uh, get involved. So uh, that's why we launched the Peaceful Streets program. The, you know, our mission is just to educate and inform the people of that police abuse exists, uh, let people know what their rights are, um, so when they come into contact with the policeman, they can limit the harm done to them, de-escalation tactics, so that they can limit uh, the violence done to them, you know, if they come across uh, an enraged rogue cop, and then finally, uh, ways to document the police officer, uh, primarily, ideally, through technology, through audio or video. And then, on July 14th, we're going to have a conference where we're going to bring together civil liberties, civil rights activists. Pete Ayer is going to come down from New Hampshire to, to speak with us. Um, we're going to have a victim's panel. We're going to have a historian. We're going to have breakout sessions. It's going to be a great conference. Uh, again, just to highlight the point that there is police abuse, but that we, the people of Austin, um, and then hopefully this uh, other communities pick this up as well, that we can fight back. And we're not going to wait for the political systems to help us. We're certainly not going to wait for the cops or politicians to help us because, you know, they're in no hurry to help us. Uh, but we're going to help each other by going out there and recording the cops and, and standing up for each other. And at the end of the conference, we're going to hand out 100 video cameras uh, to activists here in Austin so they can go out and start videotaping. And it's funny, after my incident with the cops, I went out and bought myself a flip cam. And I have now recorded the cops probably on a dozen occasions since then, just because when I see a cop, um, if he's doing something illegal or if he's uh, interacting with the people, I just go ahead and whip out the camera and I start videotaping. And it's amazing. Uh, two things. One is what cops will do even when you're videotaping. <laughs> you know, um, they'll still break laws. But two is by being there and being that presence with a video camera, I believe it does curtail the behavior of some cops and it takes a situation where they may otherwise go ahead and beat someone or, you know, uh, you know, make up a completely fraudulent claim, um, illegally arrest the person, and, and it might just allow that person to go on their way. So um, we're pretty excited about this. Uh, we don't have any aspirations that this is going to lead to political change um, or legislative change, but we do hope that what this does is it engages the community and it gets people to start standing up for each other. And uh, you know, if if even you know ten thousand people in Austin, you know, started to uh, monitor the police, uh, the the situation would be radically different.